Now that we know something about what we want to manufacture in terms of the design specification, and secondly, uh, we have some idea of the processes and what's involved in uh, performing the necessary operations to produce a product, uh, we've reached a decision point here, and this is a major uh, decision that needs to be made, and that is, should we produce this product ourselves, or should we find a vendor that can produce it for us? Now, some of these decisions are straightforward, such as fasteners. You're not going to go out and start creating your own fasteners. But other uh, parts that you're making, the decision is not so obvious. And I think that Platts does a good job of capturing the kinds of things you want to think about when you are performing a make versus buy decision. And he frames this as a multi-attribute decision-making problem, which is essentially saying that it's a messy problem and there's no magic formula, uh, but there are things that need to be evaluated and assessed in order to come to a rational decision. So let's take a look at how he frames this problem. Uh, again, it's quite messy. And the perspective here is there are a number of areas that need to be evaluated. And as you can see, these areas are in the center here. First of all, the technology and manufacturing processes. And we've looked at it from a generic point of view of a process model and process capability. But clearly there are specifics related to the individual processes necessary to produce the transformations that are going to help you meet the design specifications. The second item, which is also a major consideration, is the cost of producing that part. And we'll be looking at that in much more detail later on. Versus the acquisition cost if we are going to purchase it from a vendor. How do those match up? Another area of the supply chain is also important because that essentially tells you how your parts are going to come together uh, from uh, various vendors as well as internally in order to uh, produce the final product. And then finally, any support systems that we have in place that help us produce this product. Clearly, quality is an issue information systems in terms of tracking and monitoring, engineering change systems, which we've talked about previously, continuous improvement, and clearly there's a major emphasis on that uh, throughout the industry. The performance measures that we can think about in terms of uh, how well our organization is performing, and this isn't meant to be exhaustive here, but it gives you some ideas as to uh, how well we perform relative to other uh, vendors and producers. Cost savings, what types of cost savings are we seeing? Uh, how well are we using the capacity that we have? By capacity, we mean our ability to produce. And what does it take to get our product to market? Now, that's a key indicator here that will tell us something about our competitiveness. We've already talked about quality in terms of our process capability and our scrap rate, and flexibility, how easily can we uh, change our system so that it can accommodate changes in the market. The triggers up here represent things that happen that might cause us to reevaluate our make versus buy decision. And this is happening more and more as we see changes in the economic climate, changes in uh, the use of energy, and its effect upon our supply chain. So <clears throat> when we get these triggers, we think of the need for cost reduction. Again, this pressure is relentless. Uh, because we are competing uh, with uh, many different entities, we're going to have to uh, take a close look at how we can reduce costs on a daily basis. Or we have a lack of capacity. By that we mean our demand has outstripped our ability to produce and uh, that's a good thing. However, uh, how are we going to deal with that? Are we going to increase our ability to produce or uh, do we look to other sources to provide uh, one or more components for a product?
Also, if we have a need to reduce our time to market, uh, we might reconsider our uh, make versus buy. If we want to increase quality and we're not very good for a particular set of processes, in other words, our scrap rate is high, uh, there again, we might consider uh, moving to another source. Uh, and again, this list isn't uh, all encompassing, but you can kind of see the triggers that might uh, get us to reevaluate. Now, outside this oval here are some important uh, factors that we have no control over, and that's why they are depicted as being in this external environment. While we have no control over them, they do affect uh, what's going to go on in our evaluation. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but you can clearly see the availability of suppliers that you really do not control uh, will affect the decision. There are also political elements in terms of uh, situations such as what if you decide to shut down a plant and move it to another country, uh, that can create some difficulties uh, for your organization politically. And of course, environmental elements, are we using processes that are not uh, friendly to the environment or produce a waste stream that is extremely harmful for the environment, such as uh, plating operations? Uh, so should we reconsider us doing that or uh, should we start looking to someone who's an expert and is able to handle the environmental factors in terms of uh, not affecting the environment in a negative way? And then, of course, economic elements, uh, which are beyond our control. So the price of gas goes up. What happens to our production of the Hummer? And so you see an example of a product that essentially went away due to factors that are not under your control. So given that context uh, for our decision, here we have an assessment procedure, which we try to think about those areas and come up with some type of score that allows us to objectively evaluate both our ability as well as the ability of vendors that we might be considering. And so when we see this internal versus external, by internal we mean our ability to produce versus a vendor's ability to produce, that would be the external. Now most of what we'll talk about is just comparing with one vendor, but as you might imagine, you might consider multiple vendors and you'd have to perform that comparison as well. Now, in terms of assessment, this implies that we have data. And this can uh, take the form of numeric data, qualitative data, observations that are made, but it does take some data collection. And it is not a small task because you want to make sure you have accurate data. The areas, again, that we're going to be assessing are these four areas. And as you can see, under those areas, things are going to be grouped together. First step is to weight the relative performance importance. And that relative importance is based upon uh, each organization's uh, weight. For instance, if you are a Walmart uh, organization, of course, the primary weight is going to be given to supply chain and logistics. So that's what they're known for. Uh, versus uh, an intensively uh, technology-oriented uh, organization where you are competitive based upon your processes and the technology involved in those processes. <clears throat> so giving equal weights, of course, is essentially uh, saying that we're not really sure. And so careful consideration must be given to the assignment of those weights. Once we have the weights, then we need to determine the factors that we're going to use in each of these four areas. And uh, those factors will also have to be weighted. And so the small w represents our weights in a given area, and that's why our subscripts are ij. So for area i, i going from 1 to 4, we have the j's and N sub i indicating that you can have a different number of factors for each area, and that would not be surprising. Of course, all the weights uh, for a given i have to add up to 100, just so everything is normalized. The scoring convention is that the higher score meet, indicates the better performance uh, for a given factor. 
Then we need some type of reason or justification for assigning a score. Uh, so we can't just pick a number out of the air, but uh, what is the basis for that? And going back to data collection, is there underlying evidence that would back up that score? So our score S sub i j indicates a scoring for factor j in area i. Again, we're going to have uh, n sub i of those. In other words, we're going to have multiple scores. Okay, here's an example that uh, Platts provides that gives you an idea of how <clears throat> you might go about uh, scoring this, again, based on qualitative as well as uh, quantitative factors. So if we look at, uh, for instance, factor two here, cost reduction activity with suppliers, uh, we would need evidence here, again, of either results or initiatives. So how many times have we uh, had a project where we focused on cost reduction in conjunction with the supplier? And so there's going to be an assessment. Now, one through five is just a Likert scale type of rating, but uh, one extreme would be a project going on uh, throughout the year versus uh, no projects uh, related to cost reduction and that would be this extreme of the scale. So you have to make a judgment as to what a five might correspond to. Are we talking about five projects, two projects? What might that indicate? And then the box here, we're giving our justification. So why did we score one? Well, you might say there was zero effort in terms of projects or assessments related to cost reduction. Uh, here we have a very quantitative factor, uh, always achieves delivery targets. Well, you can back that up with evidence based upon uh, the reports of uh, delivery time versus uh, the scheduled delivery time. And if it's 100%, that's what we're saying by always, then you're going to give it a 5, whereas 0%, we're always late, uh, that would be a problem. So in this case, it would be very easy to assign a score based upon the percentage of on-time deliveries to our customers. Once we go through and we score all the individual factors, uh, then we combine that score to get an overall score. And this is just the area of supply chain logistics. We would have to do this for each of the four areas. So once we have our scores, then we'll calculate our weighted scores, which is essentially just giving us a weighted average of a score based upon how important it is. So S sub I represents a score for an individual area. And then we can come up with a total score, S with no subscript, by adding up the scores, the S sub I, for uh, each area times the weight of that area. And now we have a uh, total or composite score. We can compare the score to a vent one or more vendors and see how we match up. And we can also compare the scores in individual areas. Once we have the scores, we can perform this gap analysis, which identifies uh, potential disparities, how well you match up with the vendor. So essentially, we'll calculate the difference between our score, the internal, and the vendor score, the external. And we'll uh, multiply that difference by the weight divided by 100. So you can see by taking that difference, this gap uh, value that we're going to plot here is going to, uh, in that area, again, what we're looking at here is essentially factoring out uh, the importance of that area. We can have a negative value indicating that our score is lower or a positive value indicating that that is a strength for us. And here is the example from the paper where you can see in the four areas we have a poor performance in the supply chain area but a very strong performance in both cost 
and our manufacturing processes. And so this is the type of messy decision that we have to make. Uh, if we look at this, we've got both strengths and weaknesses. And it's not unusual, uh, again, to see a small gap in the support systems because typically the W sub I for that area is uh, relatively small. So really it boils down here to a decision. Uh, should we produce it or should the vendor produce it? So how important is the supply chain uh, to us versus we have definite advantage in costs and manufacturing processes? So it's not a clear-cut decision by any means, but at least we have uh, some understanding uh, based on evidence of how well we're performing. So uh, many cases we might be leaning because of the cost advantage here to producing it ourselves and then do something about our supply chain performance uh, what can we do to improve that so that we're at least closer to zero or we move in a positive direction? So that might be a good strategy to take in this context. Uh, we might also consider sensitivity analysis, which is always a good idea in any type of evaluation. And really, you're asking the question here, how important are these weightings? Will they uh, make a major impact if the weightings were different? So we'll go to the extremes and set the weighting for each individual uh, W sub i equal to zero. And then we'll renormalize based on the fact that we've changed uh, the weightings. So this W star sub i is the uh, new weighting. And then we'll exclude the other three areas. That would be the other extreme by setting their weights to zero. In other words, W sub i is equal to 100. And then we can graph the impact of that, again, using our scores. Right? Uh, so we're looking at our score and seeing how does that affect that uh, result as we go between 0 and 100% for a given area. So we get something that uh, looks like this. As we change the weight, oops, as we change the weight, of technology and manufacturing processes, what's the effect on our total score that was S? As you can see here, it's going to be linear because our functions are linear. And uh, we have an interesting phenomena occurring at this point. So where are our weights on our x-axis? Uh, did we select a weighting here, here, and so forth? That's going to affect the outcome of how we might consider our comparison between uh, us and our supplier. So to interpret that, you think, uh, well, if there's no intersection, then we're good because uh, we'll have no crossover point and nothing will change based upon that weighting. So our outcome should be the same. If, however, we have an intersection, that indicates that we do have this reversal point where we would make a different decision. And so here we need to be careful if the weight that we originally selected is cl <coughs> close to that reversal point, uh, then we might reflect on our decision and see how that might change our outcome. Because you're essentially saying that it's very sensitive to the weighting. Ultimately, though, you're going to have to come down to a decision. Don't forget, this is a Boolean decision. It's either uh, us making it or we're purchasing it from the outside. Now, there are some combinations where we do uh, go to outside vendors, even though we are also making it in-house, but that tends to be more a capacity issue and not a major decision, such as a make versus buy decision. Well, one of the factors that we said, one of the areas was the cost consideration. And so we're going to consider our production costs versus our vendors costs in terms of what it would cost us to purchase it from that vendor. So we need to have some understanding of what goes into this uh, cost area. Essentially what we're talking about is some type of economic justification or case. We need to make a case for us producing it versus going outside somewhere. In order to do that, we need to have an ability to estimate the cost of production which means that you need certain parameters to tell you how the uh, cost is being driven by your system. We'll also need to know something about our manufacturing system performance, 
which ultimately comes down to the individual performance of processes and then the support systems that integrate those processes. And then, of course, we can compare our results to outside bids from vendors and suppliers. Where do we start? Well, you have to have a model of some kind. And these models uh, vary depending upon uh, how organizations uh, might be set up. But fundamentally, they're quite similar. Uh, some of the boxes, as you can see here, might differ in terms of location and contents. But certainly, if we look at direct costs, those are pretty much the same across any organization. And so in direct costs, we think of uh, versus indirect. We think of those costs involved in uh, direct changes to our product as it goes through our system. Now, what do we mean by direct? By direct, you're essentially talking about those costs related to adding value to the product. So if we are adding value to the product, then we're going to categorize those as direct costs. Now, how do we know we're adding value to the product? Well, we said before that we're going to see some delta, some change in the geometry or and or the materials. Now, by materials here, we're talking about the materials that end up in the hands of the customer. So direct labor, those are people directly involved in the transformation. Direct material, that's the actual material flowing through the process that is changed. And the equipment that we're using to perform that change. If it's not involved, if we've got some cost source that is not involved in this change, uh, directly involved, then we're going to say that it is indirect. For instance, material handling. So a fork truck transferring material from workstation A to B is not directly involved in that, but it indirectly is involved. So when you think of indirect, you're thinking of an indirect adding of value. Right? It's a secondary system. And there we can have labor, right? So people who are inspecting parts, they are not adding value, but indirectly, of course, uh, they are adding value. And then we might have materials that are indirectly involved. Uh, they don't end up with the customer, but they do support the process. Of course, maintenance functions uh, would be indirect uh, with their necessity. We can't run the system without it, but they would be considered indirect. And then we might group another grouping of others. So you're familiar with utilities that we have to pay, taxes, and so forth. And then uh, over on the right side, we have our uh, marketing administration and technical. And these are not directly adding value, but indirectly uh, they are uh, producing value in our system. If we take all these costs together, they are going to help us identify our ability to compete on a cost level. Now, let's think about the time element here. And uh, when I think of uh, time, I think of <coughs> producing uh, product. And as we produce product over time, we see production volume increasing perhaps, and as that production volume increases, we have a variable cost, a fixed cost, and we have a total cost. So if you look at these uh, simple curves here, you should be, be able to identify the three of those. Clearly, a fixed cost is constant with our production volume. Now, what we mean by the time element is, will that always be true? So at certain stages in time, we might see a jump in that cost. And so our fixed cost, uh, <clears throat> so perhaps the uh, taxes that we're paying on the uh, facility might be constant. And then at some point, it might change. The total cost indicated by the red line is the sum of our variable costs and our fixed costs. <clears throat> the variable costs indicating, again, that there's a relationship between the cost and production volume. In other words, a unit cost, if I divide the cost by 
the production volume. So there's uh, a certain amount we're going to spend per unit and that is not constant as we go across the production volume. So when you look at the different elements of your system, you want to be thinking about what fits into the fixed cost category versus the variable cost. And sometimes it's not obvious. So if we look at the direct labor, uh, material, tooling costs, inventory costs, equipment costs, you need to determine whether or not that is going to be a variable cost or a fixed cost. So if I look at direct labor, uh, as I increase the production volume, uh, there's going to be a certain amount of investment of direct labor in that particular uh, product that we're producing and therefore we think of direct labor as being a variable cost. We also have a material cost and so a certain amount of material is going to go into the product and therefore uh, the total amount will vary depending on how much we produce. Now tooling cost that's not straightforward. So it really depends on the type of tooling that's involved. If it's consumable for each item then after a certain period of time, that's our time element, it is going to uh, change and therefore is it a fixed cost? Well, it might be fixed over some time horizon uh, and then we're going to increase it because we've increased our production volume. If we have a robust system, our inventory cost should be constant no matter what the production volume. Uh, if our inventory cost and you might think of that as, for right now, just holding cost. As the amount of inventory goes up, obviously the holding cost is going up. Uh, so if our inventory cost is proportional to production volume, then it would be a variable cost. But that would also indicate that we might not have a very good uh, design for our system in that the inventory is increasing with the amount we're producing. Equipment cost, again, within some uh, horizon there, we might see uh, that being fixed. And then if we need to increase capacity, we'll have to go out and buy more equipment. And so we would see a bump in the fixed cost going up. But within some window here, uh, we're going to see a fixed cost for equipment. Now, when we look at labor, and specifically uh, direct labor, uh, first of all, we can have different grades. In other words, the rates that we're paying differ. And therefore, we might have to come up with some type of uh, composite similar to what we did with the weighted averages in the make versus buy decision. And so this could be weighted based upon the percentage of uh, operators that are being paid in each grade. So we come up with some overall uh, dollar per hour. Again, that would be a weighted average. Rework, uh, of course, can be tricky in that rework tends to be highly variable. And so how do we evaluate its uh, contribution to the overall cost? And of course, we have to understand the use of standard time. Uh, when standard time is being employed, as you know, standard time is essentially providing an additional allowance uh, beyond what we think the actual time to produce the product might be. And so there's a certain percentage uh, of leeway factored into the standard time. And if it is a organization uh, that has a union involved, then of course that is negotiated with the union uh, at the time of changes to the system. We also have to consider the benefits that are being paid, not just the hourly rate. And so that makes a uh, contribution to this dollar per hour. And then we might also have incentives that we tie to our ability to produce. Now in the graph down here, what you can see on the x-axis is our production rate. So that's our throughput. And the y-axis is the cost. And when we think about the amount of labor content, when I say labor content, I'm talking about dollars here from direct labor. Uh, 
as our ability to produce our production rate increases, what we're essentially doing is reducing the amount of labor content in dollars per part. And so we see here our curve going down. How is that happening? Well, it may be due to an incentive structure where we are going to pay out a certain incentive. In this case, it's a linear function. It may not always be that case. If we encourage uh, the cycle time uh, reduction, then we're going to see that increase in production rate. Uh, but our incentive cost goes up, as you can see here. So if we add the two together, you can see there's some tipping point here where uh, we want to keep our incentive in this region because that maximizes our production rate and also gives us the minimum cost. Uh, again, for these simple functions, but you get the idea. We want to choose a incentive that will keep us at that minimum cost. Now, what happens when you increase the production rate in the system? So it's not just a matter of uh, changing a dial and keep increasing your production rate, but that has certain impact on our overall system. And in most systems, the net impact as you increase the production rate is it tends to uh, produce other side effects. And those side effects can uh, be a direct result of an in inability to handle this increase in production rate by support systems, uh, such as, for instance, material handling systems, maintenance systems, uh, or inventory systems. And as a result, it can put stresses on the system, which in effect increase our cost. So you don't just want to needlessly increase the production rate because it can negatively impact your overall system if you're not careful about dealing with those increases. Uh, what about material? Well, as we've seen in our analysis of the design, we know how much uh, raw material is going into our product. That was our Q in the process model. We should also know something about our process in terms of how much waste we're producing. We should also know something about the scrap rate and any additional material that we need to add during rework. So we've got scrap and we've got waste potentially that uh, could go into salvage, if at all possible, which would perhaps return uh, some dollar value to our organization. When I think of equipment, I'm thinking of our process. And uh, again, we're thinking of direct costs here. What is necessary to produce the transformation? So are we talking about furnaces? Are we talking about machine tools? Uh, are we talking about uh, brake press. I mean, we need equipment that will guarantee that we have the necessary transformations. We also need tooling to support that and uh, potentially fixtures, any type of machinery that's involved, controls, and in what's increasingly becoming a cost factor is the software because a lot of our equipment is computer control. And so we invest a lot more money in software and this is becoming an increasing source of cost to the organization. When we purchase equipment, there is the capital necessary to go out and buy it. And that can be significant depending on how complex the equipment is. So when you think about that capital, what you're going to do is spread that out in terms of dollars over future production. So when we say future production, you should think about engineering economy and the time value of money. Now, for the sake of our uh, discussions, we'll assume that everything has been brought to a present worth so that we're dealing with the same value in terms of today's dollars. But whenever you think about future production, that is always dangerous because there's some degree of uncertainty as to how much you will be producing. For example, I mentioned the Hummer. Uh, we're not producing that anymore. And so if you were to look out seven years, uh, for instance, if the equipment had a seven-year life, 
that's a pretty big gamble in terms of guessing on what the future production is going to look like. And that will vary from industry to industry. Also involved in our costs is training of operators and uh, maintenance people to uh, deal with that piece of equipment. So there's a certain investment up front that we're going to make. Again, when we think about those dollars of investment, that will have to be borne by the future production. And then we have maintenance of that equipment. Uh, so each year we're going to have to perform preventive as well as unscheduled maintenance. And then at the end of its useful life, we might be able to obtain some salvage value uh, by selling it to someone who's interested in that equipment. So there's a lot of uncertainty involved in this equipment cost, and that's not surprising because uh, it's very difficult to predict the future. Our indirect labor, of course, we have, uh, and this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of some of the items you might consider in indirect. Maintenance, that's essential. Uh, material handling, again, transferring product from workstation to workstation. Inspection of our product, that's critical to uh, identify scrap and as well as verify that the product we're sending to the customer meets specifications. We definitely need shipping and receiving functions to bring material in to send our product down. Ordering and inventory, we need that to control our materials within the facility. And of course, line management to make sure that our uh, production lines are available when they need to be available. If we look at indirect materials, again, these materials do not directly add value to the product. But when we look at packaging and dunnage, uh, that's important material, even though it's not direct material. Dunnage, of course, is, are uh, items that we use to protect our product as it moves through our facility and perhaps in shipping. And so we have special type of carriers that prevent uh, mars and uh, flaws from occurring through the handling of the product as it's being transferred. Of course, uh, you're familiar with pallets, uh, maintenance supplies, anything we need to uh, maintain our equipment, storage costs uh, in terms of, again, we're talking about warehouses, trailer rentals, again, indirect costs. So we covered a number of factors that we might consider uh, in a cost model. What we'll do next is take a look at how we might quantify those costs based on our understanding of what's happening in our system, as well as the sources of those costs that we've already covered here.